so much for the uh, introduction and uh, welcome everyone for this very early morning session i hope everyone is able to hear me and see the slides so uh, over the next 40 45 minutes or so we'll be talking about an overview i mean 45 minutes is um, too small a time to tell you details about all aspects but i will try to give you a a good overview about what radiation therapy in breast cancer means and what it stands for, what's the current evidence, problems, issues, advances, so on and so forth. So you would be aware about <clears throat> the uh, spectrum hypothesis because there was a time uh, it was considered that breast cancer is a is a local local or a local regional disease and there was a a different time when it was considered an entirely systemic disease but now we know it's like something uh, the, in the in the middle of these two extremes so you could have predominantly local disease predominantly systemic disease and then you have a spectrum so that's a spectrum hypothesis as we stand here today in 2023 uh, what are the indications i'm giving you a, a kind of a summary at the beginning itself uh, so that you have an impression at the beginning itself as to uh, what are the current indications for post mastectomy RT. More than 5 cm tumor size, more than equal to 4 axillary lymph nodes. Now it's being said that more than equal to 1 axillary lymph nodes is also a, a criteria for giving PMRT. Locally advanced breast cancer, irrespective of new adjuvant chemotherapy response, Whenever there is a positive margin or a residual disease post mastectomy, again that becomes an indication. And then there is emerging evidence of triple negative, stage 1, 2 and other uh, uh, some indications which are being explored in trials in post mastectomy patients. Uh, what are the indications of RT uh, post breast uh, conservation? in 2023 so all cases all cases that's the thumb rule, thumb rule that you should remember that all cases post breast conservation should be given radiation and preferably should be given a boost as well uh, what about axilla in 2023 as we stand there is Axillary radiation is not necessary if axillary dissection has been done. There is some evidence of giving axillary RT in patients with perinodal extension or one should certainly give axillary RT if there is gross disease that has been left along the axillary veins. Uh, but uh, as we will discuss later in the presentation, there is a kind of a renaissance of axillary RT. I'll tell you why and how. Uh, irradiation of supraclavicular region uh, in 2023, if more than four or more axillary lymph nodes are positive in locally advanced breast cancer, irritation of internal memory region uh, in 2023, patients with involved internal memory nodes. Now, just going back a few years, it was in 1997 when this landmark paper came up by the Danish uh, uh, by Dan uh, Danish group and it was landmark because before that there was quite a bit of nihilism about the role of radiation in breast cancer and some people said that oh, oh it just adds a bit of toxicity doesn't do anything good so this randomized paper which was published in NEGM in 1997 actually proved uh, beyond doubt that at 10 years compared to uh, no radiation, those who have radiation have a 23% absolute local control benefit and 9% absolute, this is not relative, this is absolute overall survival benefit. So uh, the, the updated data was also uh, presented after 20 years and it still showed that there was 16% local control benefit and 10% overall survival benefit if you, give, if you used RT. So the other um, uh, question that has been tried in literature extensively is BCT versus MRN. Is there a difference? What is the difference in their outcomes? And there have been quite a few randomized trials, as you can see in this slide, which have tested this question, uh, whether it's from the Fisher group, whether it's from the Veronese group. So they have all addressed this question, and we have reasonably good information that uh, there is no difference at all in overall survival in these two approaches. There 
have been some concerns that, okay, is a local recurrence rate a bit higher with breast conservation in these trials, but the overall survival difference, there was no difference at all. And then you have more recent uh, evidence that is there, uh, which has taken into account uh, the patients which have come from prospective series, retrospective series, more recent data, which tells you that there is actually no difference in con local control rates and overall survival in these two approaches. And in fact, in some groups, such as the T1 and 0 group, conservation actually seems to be uh, having better outcomes. Now, again, this uh, study which I am presenting before you, these are 25 population-based studies which were included in the meta-analysis and compared to mastectomy, BCS was associated with better OS in, in, in these studies. Now, in uh, 2005 came this landmark publication in Lancet. Uh, now, these are post-mastectomy patients and you can see the clear difference uh, the clear betterment of uh, local control, the clear betterment in overall survival, breast cancer-related mortality when you give uh, local RT post mastectomy. And the same effect you see for breast conservation, actually even uh, more significant effect in, in some instances. So you can see uh, the on the left side, you can see any first recurrence, patients with N0, P, N0 disease, patients with P, N disease, N plus disease, which are in the lower part of the diagram. So both groups are showing significant benefit when you add radiation. And this benefit is getting translated into, as you can see on the right side, you can see these curves are getting split because breast conservation plus RT is giving you better uh, uh, breast cancer related mortality as well. Now, so important is the correlation between local recurrence and breast cancer mortality that EBCTCG actually gave a formula, which was M is equal to L by 4, which means that if you prevent four recurrences, so 4 by 4 is equal to 1, so you are uh, preventing one death. You prevent four recurrences, you prevent one death. So that was the strong correlation formula that was given by ABCTCG. Now over the years, now this was many years ago, like 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Over the years, what we have seen is that local recurrence rates are actually falling. They're actually falling. So in earlier studies, as you know, local recurrence rates around 8.5% after breast conservation, 23 to 2.5% after mastectomy. And since then, they have actually halved. So now in modern series, if you see breast cons after breast conservation, especially in early breast cancer patients, recurrence rates are hardly 1% or 2% at five years. And this has happened because of several reasons betterment in radiation therapy techniques, betterment in systemic therapy techniques, better surgical outcomes, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, one of the questions that keeps on coming is that, what about post mastectomy radiotherapy in patients with locally advanced breast cancer who have achieved a PCR? So they, have been, they have been given chemo and they have achieved a PCR. Now, is there any role of radiation? So, there is no visible disease now. But uh, we have many series, and I'm just showing one of these series, uh, in which this came from MD Anderson, which told us that RT is very, very important in patients who had initially LABC. What about one to three positive lymph node patients? So we have definitely emerging data, and the data that we saw from the earlier trials, if we see the patients who have one to three node positive patients, they seem to have an equal kind of a benefit compared to patients who had four or more positive notes, and this was further corroborated by the EBCTCG 2014 publication in Lancet, which had around 1,300 patients with one to three positive notes, median follow-up of nine years. And what this EBCTCG analysis said, so top panel, if you see, these are patients with one, uh, one to three positive notes on the top three curves. The bottom three are patients with N uh, and four, P and four. A plus, four or more node positive. So, as you can see, the gap between the curves or the benefit of RT is actually kind of similar in the upper and the lower, which means that patients with one to three probably derive 
an equal measure of benefit as per the EBCTCG analysis. What about T3 N0 patients? You have operated up front, this is a T3 patient N0. So first of all, you ensure that it's indeed N0, adequate nodal resection has been done. Remember, this is a very heterogeneous kind of a group. And uh, in this group, local recurrence rates can vary from just 5% to 50%, depending on whether adequate dissection has been done, what is the kind of biology of this tumor, nodal dissection, local resection. So, uh, but remember, 80% of all local recurrences happen in the chest wall in this group of patients. So, better to see presence of other risk factors and go ahead with radiation in such population. What about stage one? So, till now, you would have realized that we are talking about radiation uh, patients who have more than 5 centimeter tumor, nodal positive, so on and so forth. What about a specific group of triple negative patients with stage 1 and 2 breast cancer? So there was a prospective randomized multicenter study. This came from China, uh, which actually tested in such population adjuvant chemo versus adjuvant chemo plus local regional RT with a median follow-up of 86 months. They actually found that there was survival benefit if you gave. However, this has still not become the standard of care, mind you. So it is still investigational, but then in special situations, when you have additional risk factors, you could think about this. Now, you must have also heard about something which is called a boost. And this this issue comes up in breast conservation patients. So after you have finished whole breast radiotherapy, then you must have heard this term boost. So it's just an additional amount of dose that is given to the or to the tumor bed and and with a margin, because most of the recurrences uh, happen, local recurrences happen around this region. So you have several randomized trials telling you that there could be a relative benefit of. Uh, 30 to 50 percent reduction of further recurrences like 7.3 percent becomes 4.3 percent in absolute terms so um, then uh, is there any specific subgroup so you would be able to see that all the patients are actually benefiting from local uh, breast boost tumor bed boost but the, the the most important population that is going to benefit from this are the patients who are less than 40 to 45 years, the younger population, it's most, most critical to give an additional boost in this population, although uh, each and every uh, group of, uh, age group of patients benefit by, by boost. And these are the ideal dose and fractionations that are given after whole breast radiotherapy to the boost region. But another thing that I would like to highlight here that the hypofractionated trials, I will be talking about this, and the extreme hypofractionated trials were not designed to address the question of boost. They generally ended up giving whole breast radiation in a very select group of patients, around 10%, 20%, they gave boost. Now, you also... Many of you would be aware that typical radiation schedules are varying from approximately five, five and a half, six weeks. That used to be the traditional radiation schedule for breast cancer patients. Five to six weeks, especially for conservation when you had to give a boost as well. And this very important paper, this, not, this come from the West. So even West, they are facing these problems. So as you increase the distance, travel distance of the patient, see how drastically breast conservation rates come down. 1 to 0.76 to point like 50% drop here, 0.55. Then ah, almost 80% drop. You go to 0.14 or more than 80 miles if you are away from the facility. And it's a very low uh, um, uh, reception of radiation also after conservation. So these are the problems that uh, radiation oncologists also have been concerned about. So this is the standard fractionation. Uh, this is the hypofractionation thing. So that is why hypofractionation was uh, came into picture because you give lesser fractions, probably you improve compliance, make it more convenient for the hospital, convenient for the hospital as well as the patient. So we have schedules that give approximately three weeks, finish the entire treatment, and then you have extreme hypofractionation, which is coming up now, like the fast forward trial you must have heard. So which just finishes the entire treatment in a week's time. 
I will spend a bit of time on hypofractionated radiotherapy because this is what is in vogue mostly right now. So, um, as you can see in this chart, uh, it has been used for early invasive breast cancer. It has been used for total mastectomy patients. It has been used for DCIs as well. So, um, there are uh, regimens which are non-accelerated hypofractionation, which means that you are giving hypofractionation, but you are giving, for example, alternate day or weekly kind of a thing. So, entire treatment duration is still five, five and a half. Then you have accelerated hypofractionated RT, where the entire treatment finishes in around three weeks. For example, the STAR B trial and the Chinese trial. And then you have uh, the fast forward trial, which is ultra hypofractionated RT, just one week and the entire treatment is over. For total mastectomy patients, you had a randomized trial from Beijing, DCIS, there was a drug 0701 trial. Now, uh, this gives you an overview of these trials. So, this is the conventional fractionation, week 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 days a week, Saturday, Sunday off. So, you can see these 5 dots in each column. Then you have the trials. So, see how these trials were designed. So, start pilot, start A, they had the duration of 5 weeks, but they were kind of giving alternate day treatment. You see only 3 dots and you see 2 dots the next week, then you see 3 dots and 2 dots and so on and so forth. That means dot means a fraction of radiation in a day. Then you have the start B trial where you finished, you gave continuous 5 days a week fractionation and you finished the entire treatment in 3 weeks. And similar for the MD Anderson and the TROG trial and so on. And similarly for the Beijing trial. And then you have that FAST trial, which gave once a week fractionation, just once a week and finished in five weeks. And then you have the latest FAST forward trial, which you in which daily fractionation was given just five days. Uh, but remember, remember this, you can't use each and every fractionation for each and every patient. You know, there are a group of patients for which you could use any of these. But there is a group of patients where, for example, fast forward has not been really tried and tested. So you see these inclusion criteria uh, of the patients now. Uh, most of the patients PT1 to PT2, most of these patients, as you can see, fell in this group. Then nodal positivity again, around 20 to 30% or less, 0 to 20% or so. Then chemotherapy use, again, very few patients, maybe around 15 to 20% of the patients received chemotherapy. Regional nodal irradiation, again, was not given in most of these trials, except the Beijing trial, of course. So um, around uh, 15 to 20% just received regional nodal irradiation. Boost. Again, if you see the STAR B trial, just 40% received boost. If you see the fast forward trial, just around maybe around 20% received uh, boost. Just to give a flavor of the hypofractionated trials, and their outcomes were definitely quite impressive, uh, very impressive local control rates compared to the five week schedules. So they were equal in cosmetic outcomes, they were equal in control rates, they were equal in toxicities compared to the longer schedules in this these kind of groups of patients. Okay, so now we shift gears. I'll just talk a bit about post mastectomy radiation. This was the way traditionally we used to put a few lines here and there and then kind of uh, do a a fluoro or an x-ray, check x-ray to see what we are treating, take a bite, small bite of the lung as you can see here, a tangential kind of a portal that was given to treat these patients. But now modern day uh, breast cancer planning, whether it's post mastectomy or conservation, it's entirely CT based. So you, took a, you take a CT, you contour this region which has to be treated, take care of the heart, take care of the lungs, draw these contours, take care of the contralateral chest wall or the contralateral breast, whichever uh, the situation might be. And then you have these dose volume histograms telling you what portion of the heart is seeing how much dose, what portion of the, the target volume is. So this red line represents the target volume, which is giving them, we are giving the maximum dose. And you can see the low or the very low dose that we're giving to the adjacent organs 
to to spare them they can there will be a situation where adjacent organs will receive zero dose we haven't treated that technology so far but with modern technology these doses have become lesser and lesser and lesser and that is very good for the patients so as i was saying traditionally this was a whole based radi- radiation followed by a boost to the tumor bed again i talk about these logistic issues because there there was one more thing that happened uh in the entire spectrum of breast cancer radiotherapy because of the same logistic issues because of the same issues for which we started hypofractionation the same issues also led us to partial breast irradiation in a way for a select group of patients again not for one and all for a select group of patients so uh and the rational there was a strong rational so rational was that post in post mastectomy specimen we saw disease uh, in 37% in that tumor region in 50% it was in a 1 cm or 1 1/2 cm zone beyond the actual gross tumor and then in just 10 to 13% patients you had the small foci here and there in the entire breast so that means that the focus of the disease or the focus of the uh, of the tumor um, uh, microscopic tumor disease is around the gross tumor and in the gross tumor around the gross tumor and the second reason that uh, made us do it was proof of the pudding is where are the recurrences happening so 90% of 95% of the recurrences multiple trials tell us of the local recurrences 95% happen in tumor bed vicinity of all the local recurrences and far away recurrences are rare so even if you might have some foci distantly located as you can see in 10% of this thing that this study found these actually don't manifest and especially in these days when you are giving most of the time new agent chemotherapy so you don't need to worry about these small tiny cells that could be located in rest of the breast so because of these two rationales apbi or accelerated partial breast irradiation came up which means it is accelerated which means that the treatment is finished in a short span of time maybe one session maybe two session maybe five sessions and it's partial so there are two terms here one is accelerated second is partial so i have told you the meaning of accelerated partial means you just treat a small zone beyond the the gross tumor in the operated patient just treat this irradiate only this area focus only on this area but for whom it's not for the entire thing so toxicities would be lesser if you treat le- lesser treatment volume and lesser volume would also mean that you could finish the entire treatment in a shorter duration but not for everyone there is a selection criteria for these patients and there is a strong selection criteria that you need to keep in mind always for example if in this slide you see the latest criteria which are from astro which are from american breakthrough society jack astro and american society of breast surgeons and most of these criteria for apbi you would realize are patients who are more than 45 to 50 years of age usually t1 early t2 less than 3 cm tumor size usually no negative population and uh, mostly idc some have taken dcis as well um margin should be completely negative um lvsi preferably negative so most of these trials of apbi have kind of given us this information and that is why these are featured in uh, these guidelines of the selection criteria and you would have different methods for doing apbi and the same methods could also be used for the breast boost uh, that we use for after uh, breast conservation uh, so we have various options for doing apbi including mammocyte including mammosphere including eliot as you can see here this is an eliot thing including target you must have heard about the target therapy or the intra beam therapy and including what you see on the uh, right hand side bottom corner which is one of the most extensively used form of apbi for which you have the maximum data actually all over the world because it's been used for such a long time that is the interstitial uh, catheter based uh apbi so 95% local control rates at 5 years with most techniques of apbi with this group of patients remember the group of patients that i was talking about 
this is uh, what happens for the APBI, which we do intraoperatively, interstitial catheter based. So you, uh, the, the surgeons have resected the tumor with an adjacent margin. Uh, we put clips. There's a clip put on the muscle and the base, and there are uh, peripheral clips. There's a central clip here, and then the peripheral clips on the four edges extreme edges of the cavity, four clips again are put. And then we start the, putting the catheters, which are put uh, from, for example, they are inserted, the needle is inserted from here, and then the catheter is pulled back. So initially these are needles, which are replaced by tubes in the same session. So you could have a single, you usually have, end up having a, at least a double plane implant. This is a double plane, two planes have been put, one touching the pectoralis, second around a centimeter above, and you need to cover the entire cavity, so probably sometimes you need to put third or very rarely a fourth plane as well. So this is what happens after you have done the, um, the CT of these patients, which is done typically after two or three days of the implant, and then you do planning and treatment of this area. Cavity is given typically a one centimeter margin, and we treat a one centimeter zone beyond the cavity area. This is the, some of the results of the. Um, so, APBI is also practiced using external beam techniques. By external, it's not only the placement of something inside the cavity. By external beam, also you can give APBI. And uh, these are the, for example, the Florence APBI IMRT trial. It did APBI by IMRT. So uh, these are the APBI outcomes by various trials. Most of these are randomized trials. So the message that came out from these trials is that APBI is quite good. And, and that in the control arm, you had whole breast radiation. So uh, the message that came, local control, APBI versus whole breast radiation control rates, almost the same. We had some issues with the Elliot trial in which uh, they gave intraoperative electron where the recurrence rates were a bit higher and there were several reasons proposed for that. The quality assurance, the adjacent area beyond the cavity, did it receive enough dose and so on and so forth. And then you have some issues with the rapid trial where there was adverse cosmetic outcome using this dose. So typically 34 grade 10 fraction is used uh, for external beam and many forms of interstitial APBI as well. I now switch gears and I uh, will talk a bit about regional radiotherapy, which means the supraclavicular internal memory. There could be various combinations and permutations that can can be applied and you need, one needs to be very careful as to what area that he or she will treat for a particular patient. So you could have SCF plus IMC, SCF plus axilla, SCF plus IMC plus axilla. So <clears throat> uh, this this trial, which was published uh, by, uh, there's a new OTC trial, which was published in 2015. Port Pence led this study, 4,000 patients. So uh, they uh, had a primary endpoint of overall survival, which was, however, not achieved. Uh, compared to local RT, it was local RT plus regional nodal irradiation, which included IMC portion of SCF, portion of medial portion of axilla as well. So they did not find any benefit of adding uh, in terms of overall survival, in terms of disease-free and distant diseases, they actually found benefit in adding uh, local regional radiation, including internal memory. However, uh, internal memory radiation remains a kind of a, a gray zone, I would say. So definitely we should treat if there were positive internal memory nodes. There are many patients who would uh, treat internal memory in a high-risk population, which is like inner quadrant tumors or axillary node pop, uh, population. So I, I would not say they are wrong, but my own preference is treat internal memory radiation only if they were involved in the PET or CT initially at the initial workup. Uh, so, so because when you add internal memory radiation, you also have to remember you are going to definitely increase side effects to, to some extent, for example, the cardiac effect or the lung effects, because you're treating a very critical area which lies very close to the heart. 
Okay, post positive sentinel lymph node axillary surgery or axillary RT, you must have heard about the MRO study. Positive sentinel lymph node randomized to axillary lymph node dissection and axillary radiotherapy median follow up of 6.5 years actually did not find any difference in the two arms. So, axillary RT in this population can also be an option. Uh, again, in the same study, did the axillary radiotherapy arm actually was doing a bit better in terms of lymphedema compared to the surgical arm. But again, as I say, both options are reasonably good. So this um, this article, which is the Lucent tool, Toolbox 2 uh, article published very recently in Lancet 2023, uh, I would say it's a, it's a must read for those who are managing axilla either by radiation or by surgical means, because it tells you, uh, although the entire thing is not based on level one evidence, but it's a mostly an expert consensus, which tells you this possible scenarios in upfront surgery scenario and then post NACT scenario. What are the options? What are the options and what are the possibilities and what area should you be treating in what situation? Now, it's very difficult for me to go one by one, but definitely go through this article. It will give you a beautiful impression of how and how this philosophy has now evolved as, as we stand today, upfront scenario and post NACT scenario. Okay, so two very important trials are going on, NSABP 51 trial, which um, is kind of randomizing patients who undergo lumpectomy or mastectomy and have post new adjuvant chemo YPN0 to uh, randomize them between RNI versus no RNI. Alliance trial, double, uh, 11202, randomizes women who remain YPN positive after new adjuvant chemotherapy and it randomizes them to exit node dissection and RNI versus regional nodal irradiation alone. So summarizing RNI, RNI continues to be guided by traditional factors in pathology. What is important for us as radiation oncologists is not to irradiate the portion of the axilla that you have dissected as surgeons that the surgeons have dissected and need to simultaneously work on standardization, contouring and QA aspects of this and future maybe uh, more evidence and biological surrogates will come which will give us greater confidence in tailoring our fields. Now, again shifting gears and talking about uh, a bit about palliative radiotherapy in breast cancer. So there can be situations where you have lump or a mass or a fungating thing. Now we know we have options such as toilet mastectomy, but sometimes that also is not possible. So we, so palliative radiotherapy of the breast tissue along with the cancer is an option which can be used 30 gray, 10 fraction, 20 gray, 5 fraction or a weekly fraction like you give 5 gray every week. Uh, depending on patient convenience. Bone metastasis, again, a frequent phenomenon in breast cancer. So local localized RT, 8 gray single fraction or 20 gray 5 fraction. If there is cord compression, better to decompress. And if the vertebra is unstable, better to decompress and stabilize it and then give local radiation. In very extensive metastatic scenarios, uh, what was used quite frequently now, uh, quite frequently earlier, but not so frequently now, was hemibody radiation. So, uh, upper hemibody or lower hemibody in patients with extensive metastasis. Again, in brain metastasis in breast cancer patients, radiation has a very, very critical role. Now, you would also realize that radiation has evolved from very simple 2D radiotherapy to 3D conformal radiotherapy to IMRT, IGRT to 4D treatments and probably we'll now see uh, we are actually also some seeing, a bit, uh, seeing a bit of uh, artificial in, uh, intelligence assisted treatments. They have already come in our planning systems now. So and I'm sure it's the use is going to spread by the day. So what I mean by 4D approaches is that we know traditionally we have been putting a beam here, beam there. These are the tangential beams. But we know that patients are not static. They are not frozen like a table or a chair or a bed. They're actually live. They're moving and they're breathing. So with that breathing motion itself, the breast could move. And we need to take care of these things uh, in the present era. And that is why to counter this motion, you have 4D simulation, you have gating, you have tracking, you have breath hold. So breath, for example, in breath hold, which I use most commonly, you ask the patient to take a breath and then the patient holds 
his breath for around 20 to 30 seconds in which we do the planning scan also in which in the same position we do the treatment also so what it does is actually it kind of increases the volume of the it makes the breast more stable it increases the volume of the lung decreases the lung toxicities and in some cases also pushes the heart away a bit from from the breast so it decreases the heart dose also in some situations what are the likely candidates to benefit from these modern new approaches patients with large breasts who are likely to have skin reactions left-sided breast cancer because the heart is a bit more closed patients who have to undergo internal mammary nodal irradiation and uh, in some situations in APBI and breast boost now um, i come to a kind of a, a rapid fire round with special situations these are special situations and i will be presenting one or two slides of each so i begin with can you use hormonal therapy concurrently with radiation and i this is about tamoxifen and while i was in tata memorial hospital i was the principal investigator i had thought about this trial we designed this trial I, we started recruitment and the recruitment was completed after a few years and now this trial was was presented in istro in the in the plenary session. So um, the 260 suitable breast cancer patients over three years were randomized. 130 received concurrent radiation and tamoxifen. 130 patients received sequential radiotherapy followed by tamoxifen. And both groups were assessed by HRCT, TGF beta, TTP, aerosol. Presently, we have presented the findings of HRCT findings. So uh, this was presented in ISTO 2023 by my colleague Kashwini. So, <clears throat> Uh, after a median follow-up of 74 months, RTOG more than equal to grade 2 pulmonary toxicity, there was no difference in the two arms. So as of now, and there was no difference in overall survival as well. The primary endpoint was lung, lung fibrosis, no difference as of now. So in this randomized trial, we did not find any difference. There have been retrospective studies previously done. 2005, you have GCO, you have three or four uh, publications of retrospective studies did not find any difference. So as of now, I think tamoxifen can be safely used along with radiation. And AIs also can be used safely with radiation. Now, sometimes you have a special situation of a pacemaker, what we encounter. We are about to plan a patient and suddenly you see a pacemaker. So remember that ionizing radiation can affect pacemakers because modern day pacemakers have CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductor technology, which is highly, highly sensitive to ionizing radiation. So very, be very careful. Try to avoid pacemaker, try to avoid leads when you are having a patient with a uh, pacemaker. The other special situation is oligometastasis. So what do you do when you have oligometastatic breast cancer? We were actually very enthusiastic when we had the COMET trial which told us that and COMET trial had uh, not only breast cancer patients, it had lung cancer patients, prostate and all the sites and it found that there was overall survival benefit if you give uh, local treatment in oligometastatic scenario. However, our enthusiasm has been dampened a bit by the NRGB B002 trial which was a phase 2 uh, randomized trial. It had to go to phase 3. However, in the phase 2 randomization itself, so there were two arms, one which was given syst uh, standard systemic therapy and the other was given, beside the standard systemic therapy, it was given local RT or surgery uh, for, for uh, ablation. So uh, the results of these trials uh, showed us that there was no difference in the, uh, in the overall survival in the, two, in the two groups. And that was a bit in the, in the progression-free survival and the overall survival. So that was a bit of a dampener. But, but more studies are going on because uh, we also, for example, in this study also one of the criticisms was that uh, with this median follow-up of 35 months, uh, probably a bit short, probably we, we should wait a bit more longer, and probably we need to modify our selection criteria for the patients in which we are doing local treatment of the oligometastatic disease. So that is where things stand as far as oligometastatic breast cancer is concerned. Can we omit radiation? Is there any, is, after, so initially, if you remember, I had given you a statement that for each and every breast patient who has, who, patient who has undergone conservation, give radiation. That is the rule of the thumb. 
people have however tried omitting radiotherapy after following breast conservation and one of these trials uh, uh, this was a prospective trial this was lumina a breast cancer trial which was which two patients who were women who more than 55 years of age underwent breast conservation grade 1 to 2 t1 and 0 remember very stringent criteria very stringent criteria luminal a her to negative ki 67 low age more than 55 years uh, t grade 1 to 2 t1 t1 and 0 and 0 so this is a very select group of patients and in these patients they with omitting radiotherapy they found a local recurrence rate of 2.3% which was reasonably acceptable but remember the very very tight selection criteria that was used there have been previous studies also clgb and the prime 2 trials which took patients more than 70 years of age randomized them found a statistically for this same kind of group of patients except more than 70 years found a statistically uh, better control rate almost i think the local control rates were 4% versus 1% if you gave radiation uh it dropped down to 1% from the 4% if you did not give radiation so local control still there was a benefit of radiation there was no difference in overall survival talking about elimination elimination can we talk about eliminating surgery can surgery be out of breast cancer now again there was very interesting trial presented by Quirer et al in Lancet Oncology you can read the full article also in 2022 so around 31 patients they took who had less than 2 cm residual breast lesion on imaging after new adjuvant systemic therapy and they did a minimum of 12 cores from vacuum assisted biopsy from the tumor bed but if they did not find any in situ or invasive uh, cancer breast surgery was omitted and patients underwent standard radiation followed up with twice a year mammo at median follow up of 26 months there was no ipsilateral breast tumor recurrences in these 31 patients so that's again a food for thought i'm not saying this is the standard of care but this is what probably will be seeing and hearing more and more so coming to side effects of radiation radiation pneumonitis you can see this picture was a big problem it happened in almost 5 to 10% patients 20 years ago now it's a very rare problem i hardly uh, encounter radiation pneumonitis especially symptomatic radiation pneumonitis is a very very rare thing if proper radiation planning has been done shoulder discomfort lymphedema again used to be big issues some time ago again with selective use of radiation in the axilla their incidence has gone down as is shown by these trials what about heart we often talk, talk about heart uh, affecting the heart with local radiation there is definitely evidence that if you if you give higher doses to the heart you could be having problems over the next 5 10 15 years and uh, for example in this example uh, there is a 50 year old woman with no pre existing cardiac risk factors so radiotherapy with a mean dose of heart of 3 gray would increase increase her risk of death from ischemic heart disease before the age of 80 years from 1.9% to 2.5%. So just 0.5% incremental uh, absolute increase. So it's not like something dramatic, something drastic, something terrible is happening. A small tiny increase is happening post radiation over the next 15 20 30 years that too can be mitigated if you do very careful radiation planning and use modern technology and ABC and breath holds as as we have discussed earlier. So these again show the as you increase the dose to the heart you have incremental issues uh, uh related to coronary artery disease and other problems but this as this study would tell you that over the years the blue lines are the 1970s cohort and uh, red lines are the early 80s green line are the uh, uh, late 80s so you can see uh that we are kind of getting better and better over a period of time term, in terms of cardiac events and this is probably related to use of better technology and uh, we ourselves at our institute have given a few new organs at risk for example delineating coronary arteries is not easy so what we have uh, shown in this study that we delineate the coronary strip based on our study of 51 patients so between these two angles 
the coronary artery moves from top to bottom. So we delineate this entire thing and call it the coronary strip. So we have the left coronary strip, we have the right coronary strip, and we use this also as an organ and wrist besides the entire heart and additional OER that we have uh, found. So I'm coming to the end of my presentation. A few take home messages. Once again, reiterating all breast conservation cases need post operative radiotherapy. Post mastectomy radiotherapy is of critical importance in indicated patients. The long-term benefit of radiotherapy on survival is proven beyond doubt in randomized trials and meta-analysis. There is need for individualized simulation, 3D, IMRT, IGRT. Modern radiotherapy is quite safe and getting safer by the day. Hypofractionated RT can be offered to most breast cancer patients. Can also be used after uh, both breast conservation and mastectomy. But for extreme hypo and APBI patients, we have strict selection criteria, you should follow that, and uh, we should all be cognizant of emerging indications of breast radiation and post mastectomy RT. So with the, those words, thank you all very much for a patient hearing. And now we can probably take a few questions. Yeah, this is very much uh, Dr. Anushil. Trainees, you may type your questions, comments in the chat box. So Dr. Anshil, you may stop sharing the screen for now. Okay. So I'll see in the chat box, are there any questions? Okay, should I, should I go to the chat box and start answering, yeah? So any inputs on gamma pod? So again, uh, it can be used, I'm not saying it cannot be used, again it can be used uh, on a select group of patients only, I'm not saying it cannot be used, but very select group of patients, you can use gamma, gamma pod for radiation. And uh, again, the issues remain the cost and the, and the expenses and the utilization of this, because again, it's used only a select group of patients. So next is, sir, kindly comment on the sequence of RT in breast, BCS, and mastectomy. So these days, as you can see, the scenario is kind of completely changed. So most of the patients, uh, a very rare subgroup of patients underwent, undergoes upfront surgery. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it's a small subgroup of patients. So many patients undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery. But in any case, we begin uh, radiation once the surgical part is done once the chemo part is done, uh, that is the time. So approximately, uh, if new adjuvant chemo has been done and surgery has, surgery has happened, we wait for around four weeks and then start uh, radiation. In case a patient has undergone, for example, upfront surgery and is now receiving chemo, then we wait for around two to three weeks, two to three weeks from the last date of chemo and then uh, start uh, radiation. Okay, uh, concurrent use with other modalities. Okay, so uh, use of radiation, I have I've already said you can use it concurrently with hormonal therapy. That is not an issue. But with CDK4, six inhibitors, be cautious. Please don't use because there is some concerning data that CDK4 inhibitors and radiation can create a problem. Concurrently with chemo, again, as of now, should not be done. However, some trials are going on in high-risk population for this. A very older studies also happened because of this, but as of now, don't use concurrent chemo. Concurrent trastuzumab along with radiation, no issues at all. Please go ahead. Concurrent TDM1 with radiation, if that is the situation, again, no problem, can go ahead with that. Now, the other question is, when do we include the SCF? in RT field. So uh, typically when you have more than four or more exogenous lymph nodes. Now again, this SCF thing is now being called level four. 
cervical level 4 node in that entire breast radiotherapy sequence so when you have four or more axillary lymph nodes it is better to treat supraclavicular region as well of course in patients sometimes you have actually supraclavicular node in all and even if the surgeon has done a supraclavicular dissection it's better to include the supraclavicular portal also then. okay uh now that the question is ypt2 n2 disease ypt2 n2 disease axillary adequate axillary dissection done axillary radiation internal mammary radiation so again uh, in this scenario you should give axillary radiation to the leftover portion don't irradiate again the area that has been dissected but just the medial portion the undissected portion uh, or the super and this and including the supra uh, the supraclavicular region has to be included in this and uh, you have also asked internal mammary radiation so i i have already replied my take on internal mammary radiation uh, i understand there are many uh, of even my colleagues which are doing internal mammary radiation in such situations i myself i am not doing i stick to my principle of doing internal memory radiation only when the internal memory node is actually seen and known however you would not be wrong if you use internal memory radiation in such situations with, with axillary residual burden after chemo as well or medial larger medial quadrant uh, tumors okay one guy is saying sir kindly share slides <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> okay how do you give boost if post bcs clips are not placed and flap is done so probably now you are asking about a scenario of oncoplasty now with oncoplasty again the boost things become a, a bit of a challenge because you need to be very in very much sync with your surgical team which means that you need to know what they are doing how clips are being placed especially if it's not just a type 1 oncoplasty type 2 or type 3 oncoplasty you need to be very sure how the tissue has moved where are the clips now where was the original tumor and then only there are no uh shortcuts or straight guidelines for this so in a clean scenario lumpectomy it's very easy to do it but if you have displacement of breast tissue you need to be very sure based on the clips based on what you sometimes it's always good to go to the ot and see what the surgeon is doing and even call the surgeon downstairs uh, to the rt planning system to get his input while you're controlling the post role of rt prior to surgery okay so there was a actually a very uh, recent trial perhaps the name of by the name of prada in which they actually give instead of post operative radiation they gave pre operative radiation entire breast and after that they took these patients for whatever reconstructions and all that stuff and did not find any significant difference so in some select group of patients even pre operative uh, uh, treatments could be done uh, but however not the standard of care so far Uh, any evidence for rt in single node positive in early breast cancer whether we can omit rt so i think i discussed this question in one two three node section uh, with one positive node there again there is a spectrum of opinions regarding this because the data uh, from the trial uh, which is being led by kunkler the randomized trial that data is yet to supremo the trial is called the supremo trial that trial data is yet to come out in open fully but for that till the time being we have to rely on the evidence that is being given by retrospective studies ebct cg and so on and so forth so even in one to three node population there is a significant role especially if these patients have some additional risk factors which could be perinodal extension very young age lvi of negativity so in combination with these definitely one should consider role of intraoperative radiotherapy so by intraoperative radiotherapy do you mean for example radiation that is given during the time of surgery 
while the patient is in OT. So there are two or three techniques that can be used for that. For example, the target trial actually did that kind of a thing. The ELIO trial did that kind of a thing. Uh, <clears throat> so it can be done. However, there have been concerns regarding uh, doing strictly intraoperative because uh, many of these trials, for example, the Elliot and the target trial, treated just one or two or three mm beyond the cavity margins. And most of the other APPI techniques have treated a centimeter or a centimeter and a half of slab beyond the, the cavity. So th those are a few concerns. So as of now, standard probably would be interstitial placement of catheters and subsequent treatment in the uh, radiation department or post-operative APBI techniques are also there. I'm not saying intraoperative cannot be used, but please uh, remember these concerns when you're doing intraoperative treatment. Uh, post pre-op SCF node positive, post NSAT with residual nodes clinically. Okay, uh, do we need to operate or leave it for radiation? Again, no randomized or hard core data for this. That if positive SCF nodes are there, I often encourage surgeons that if they can easily do a supraclavicular add clearance or a fossa clearance in case of initially positive SCF nodes, please go ahead. Uh, in case of a situation where surgeon is not keen or the nodes have kind of completely disappeared radiologically or PET CT, then we might also consider radiation alone in such situations. When to give PMRT in P, T2 and 0? I have already discussed this uh, T2 and 0 scenario. I have told you the concerns that I have for such scenarios. Ensure that this is, that it is indeed N0. Look for any additional risk factors. So one has to be very individualized in this group of patients, less than 5 centimeter tumors, N0 population. So uh, be very sure that it's not like proper dissection has been indeed done and we have we are very sure it's N0, there are no other risk factors and some particular population you could act, actually omit radiation then. And does fractionation have an effect on tumor biology like TNBC or luminal A? We have differently with different fractionation. No, 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 no such trial. No such trial which tells us that you should use different dose, different dose or different fractionation. If it is a TNBC or it, if it's a luminal A, they will respond differently to different fractionations. As of now, very hardly any data for this. Uh, what select situation where dissected uh, axillary lymph node dissections field included in RT field? Oh, you are saying that what are the situations where one has dissected the axilla and still you will irradiate the axilla. So, some situations, these situations are rare, but for example, if there is a patient who, who comes up with a report of 36 out of 36 node positive, such kind of situations can rarely happen, or 24 node positive with perinodal extension. So probably in this group of patients, you could probably think of treating the axilla as well, but again, it's a rare scenario. The, the usual uh, thing the routine patients don't need radiation to the dissected portion of the axilla, stick to the portion of the axilla that was not removed by the surgical colleagues. So, chat box thing, and then. So, I think I have answered all your questions. I hope you have. Uh, said I hope there are no further questions. Hello? There is one in Q&A. Okay, uh, one in Q&A, yes. Sir, in phase two trial where surgery is omitted, oh, the one, the trial that omitted surgery. No, no, I don't think they included, it was, it was invasive cancer in that. 
so they, it was invasive cancer it was post uh, chemo and uh, there was study by queer et al which i told you which you can go back and see so they uh, were talking about invasive and i think it's very important for uh, to to uh, it's a very important very interesting study i think all of you should go back and read that study and uh, but the problem again pitfall for that is that multiple biopsies have to be done to that local site to ensure that there is no residual disease then intensive follow up every 